big reason for that is that we provide a lot of flexibility and a lot of control over the way that you give rides. Um, setting your own price, also setting filters, et cetera, so it's really, really easy to, uh, to give a ride, including you can even give a ride on your way to something else, on your way to work. Um, so, and by the way, if you have not tried Sidecar, uh, you can try it. You can put in the promo code SUPERSUNIL and you will get $15 off your first ride. Did you all hear that? Super Sunil. How much off? 15 big ones. 15 big ones off. How many times can we use that code? Because I'm here till Tuesday. <laughs> um, so, so you were asking what will this category look like in five years? In five years, I, and I'm not kidding when I say this, in San Francisco, you will not need to own a car anymore. And if you look at, we started our company uh, a little over two years ago. And in that period of time, uh, the availability, the ability to move around town is uh, dramatically better. I hear stories all the time of people who live in, say, the Mission that previously just could not travel throughout the rest of the city you know, without owning a car because um, transit just w did not serve it very well. And today they can, they can move around uh, in those parts of the city. So the combination of a sidecar and, and our competitors, uh, transit, um, uh, as well as things like car sharing, uh, already today you can weave that together uh, uh, to make an affordable way to move around town. But in five years, A, we're going to start integrating these things together, and B, these services are going to get even better. So we have, we've introduced a new capability called Shared Rides. The idea behind that is we can match up two people who are going to similar destinations, put them in the same car, and they each split the price. So now the already very low price, it's already like 20 to 30 percent less than a taxi, becomes more like, you know, a little bit of a multiple of the cost of a bus. So incredibly convenient, door-to-door -door service, very affordable, available across the entire city. It spreads out to the suburbs. Like, you now have a network that you no longer need to, to own a car. Uh, and that opportunity is monstrously large. It's as big as e-commerce was in the early 90s. Um, so I think I've said enough, but five years from now, turn in your car keys. Very good, thank you. And Will from Rome, Georgia. By the way, I was in Rome, believe it or not, four months ago. Why? Why? That's a good question. <laughs> There's this medical thing there called the Harbin Clinic. Yeah, I know about it. Yeah, they, this is a monopoly on health care in a town for all of North Georgia, and they hired me to help them think about health reform and what they're going to do. So I was in your hometown. It was cool. Welcome. But I was glad as hell. I was really glad to get back to Nashville. I'll come back now. <laughs> so, Will, tell this well, crowd a little bit about your industry and where it's going to be in five years and how you're going to be part I of first it. First, I have a quick question for Sunil. What did you think of last night's South Park episode? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? No. Ride sharing? All right. You should watch it. You should watch it. <laughs> and you're here. Uh, so I'm CEO of Kixi. We're an online free-to-play gaming company. Uh, right now we make uh, primarily mobile and PC games. Uh, by free-to-play, I assume some of you know what I mean, but you know we don't make a traditional box product where you pay one price and get access to all the content. You get access to the game. It's completely free, um, and we have kind of virtual economies inside of the game that allow you to purchase upgrades, speed ups, and kind of enhance gameplay. Um, we really run games as a service. Uh, all of our currently operating, all of our legacy games right now have been going on for upwards of four to five years in lifespan, and um, we still see you know great profitability in those games. We expect kind of lifespan for some of those games to last upwards of ten years, possibly. Uh, so it's a bit of a, a, a departure uh, from traditional gaming. Um, but we entered at a time where uh, the game industry in general was going through a pivot um, where we saw a lot of market share going towards platforms like Facebook and browser and other browser platforms where we saw the, the gaming market expand. So we expanded, the, so we kind of took advantage of that. Uh, but our big hypothesis is we're always going to try to seek um, the intersection of accessibility and fidelity uh, versus, you know, typically gaming experiences were kind of hard to come by where you had to, 
you know, move mountains to upgrade your PC or buy the latest console, um, or you'd have to be physically in your living to, room to play these games. We want to try to provide hyper-physical accessibility while being able to have a high-fidelity game experience. <laughs> Hello? Uh, so now with uh, the technology advancements and, and mobile, you know, you've got a really high-power device that you have right in the palm of your hand, something that's the equivalent of maybe a PC that was I don't know, 10 years ago. It's pretty incredible. Um, so you can deliver a really high fidelity experience on that that you can carry in your pocket. So in terms of uh, what's going to happen over the next five years, I'm sure there's going to be um, other platforms that emerge. We definitely have our eye on virtual reality with the Oculus Rift and, and other devices that other competitors are working on. I think in five years we'll probably see um, uh, more powerful mobile gaming stations maybe um, you could even see a, something like the Oculus Rift plugging into, in, into a tablet and using that as a controller. Uh, you know, I think we'll still see PC gaming, which has actually been increasing over the last few years, which is kind of surprising. It used to be more of a niche thing, and consoles were kind of dominant. But now we've seen consoles plateau. We're seeing PC gaming increase again. We're seeing mobile gaming dwarf all of those in terms of total revenue, um, and, uh, and who knows. But you know, we're primarily a content developer. We're trying not to pigeonhole ourselves into any one platform, which I think has been um, one of our competitive advantages. We've been able to turn on the dime, turn on a dime when Facebook as a gaming platform basically died right in front of everybody and left a lot of people out of business. Um, so I think you know the key for us is to make sure that we're really flexible from a technology perspective. And we can just think about how to make great content for whatever new platform is out there that's accessible for people. So. Uh same question to you, Krista, and I especially want you to focus on, if you don't mind, a little bit about designer and designer-led businesses and where that's going as well, if you don't mind. Um, so I lead an organization called DREV, which is short for Design Revolution, and the field I'm in is product design, but it's designed for social impact. So we develop products that improve the health or increase the income of people living on less than $4 a day. We're structured as a nonprofit, but the people who buy our products actually don't know a nonprofit's behind it. So we've been focused on medical devices. Is there anyone here who's in the medical device industry? All right, I'm gonna come back to you in five years. In a minute. <laughs> um, so what we do is we develop products, um, again, medical devices, but we really look where medical devices are too expensive for emerging markets, and particularly low-income hospitals. So for example, a baby who has severe jaundice but can't get treated for something as simple as jaundice because the phototherapy device is $3,000 or $3,500. And we designed one for $400 that we licensed to an Indian company that now makes it and ships it to 21 countries. So our model really is, is to find where these gaps are in the market. And um, we are, we're about to put our second product out on the market early next year, which is a prosthetic knee for amputees who've lost their leg above the knee. So three things to know about DREV, because we're very different if you actually look at this space of design for social impact. Some of you may know about the appropriate technology movement, which was kind of this idea that you can design these products for poor people, and for the most part, those products were pretty crappy. <laughs> um, but where DREV has been um, kind of leading the, leading the charge is these are world-class products. So our products perform on par or better than the best products on the market, but they're radically affordable. Um, we take a market-driven approach, and that means that our products, once they hit the market, which again is very different than every nonprofit out there, they need to be totally economically sustainable. So we build the profit margins in, but we design for affordability from the very beginning. And the third thing is that we take this very user-centric approach, which you've probably been hearing more and more about design-led organizations, which um, was alluded to a minute ago, but starting with really understanding who our users are, what the context is. If you look at medical devices and the desire for the big companies to enter emerging markets, they say, well, this is our product line. How can we adapt that to India? And really what they're saying is, like, how can we pare it down and sell it to the high-end hospitals in India? And what we're saying is, no, we really want to understand what's going on in these low-income hospitals. How often are there power surges? How often do you lose power? How much dust is there? How do you clean things? Is there a maintenance person? And we design based on those, that context and those requirements. 
So where I think we're going to be in five years is I actually think the medical device industry is going to change drastically. There's going to be more of a focus on affordable, very user-centric devices that are actually designed for the, quote, bottom of the pyramid. And what we're seeing now with our products is we're getting demand from Americans. We're getting contacted by U.S.-based clinics and patients who said, who say to us, we've seen your products, we know they're in India, can I buy your device? And the answer right now for some of them is actually no, because we don't have FDA um, regulatory approval. Um, some, most of the countries we enter, we look where's the regulatory barrier low, and we enter there first. But things are changing very quickly, and I think when you look out five years, we're going to be in a very different environment for many products, but particularly medical devices. I think that's personally fantastic, given that almost all Americans in five years will be on a very high deductible health plan, <laughs> and the first five or ten thousand dollars will be out of their own pockets. They'll be looking for very affordable med devices, I would suspect. That's good. Um, so, Will, I'm going to start with you on this question, and uh, what I want you to think about and share with this group is, given all the, each of you are in a pretty significant leadership role, what best prepared you to lead uh, where you are today? And, um, you know, and if it's just learning the hard way and forming scar tissue, that's okay to tell us that, but uh, I, I, let's just get right to the heart of this stuff and, and talk about what prepared you to lead or not, and, uh, and, uh, how you position yourself so that you're effective at leading? Um, well, my primary answer is relatively flippant, where you know I just kind of just decided to do it one day. But if I really think back, I think it started with learning a lot of wrong ways to do it. I worked, I had some kind of crappy jobs um, before Kixi, some um, of my own doing, some working for other people. And uh, I think it's really important to learn from your mistakes and learn from other mistakes as well. A lot of things that I do around culture management and just general management approach to the company at Kixi right now is really formed from when I was a software engineer and learning and kind of taking notes around my own gripes of how I was mismanaged and how I saw other resources mismanaged. And um, so I think I formed a lot of things around trying to make sure that the structure in place of Kixi really served the individual contributor. I mean, the way that I look at an org structure, I think it's oriented the wrong way, where you typically see it from top down CEO to the bottom, I think it should be flipped. Um, where, you know, the higher up that you go on the chain of management, you really become more of an enabler. Your job primarily, one, it's to, I mean, your primary job is to do strategy, but, um, you know, that can be done in a split second. I mean, you really know the right answer, the wrong answer pretty fast. The rest is really mo removing barriers and, and blockades for, for people below you. Um, so at the end of the day, the way I see m myself is once the strategy is set, I'm removing restrictions and roadblocks and trying to make people's jobs easier so that individual contributors are more efficient. Um, I was really frustrated with kind of the red tape and decisions that seemed to take a long time when I was a software engineer for various companies that I tried to bake into our process that how can I make sure that our software engineers and product managers and designers can move as quickly as possible. Um, so, you know, I took a lot of lessons learned of what worked and mostly what did not work and tried to formulate a, a leadership strategy. Um, but, you know, I, um, I was not promoted a lot at, at other companies, at other jobs. I think I was promoted once in my entire life. So I said, you know, screw this. Blink, I'm a CEO, yay. <laughs> I encourage you all to do the same. <laughs> so, so Krista, what most prepared you to lead or not? Well, I love, Will, that you said you had a bad boss. Who's, who's had bad bosses here? Oh yeah, come on, we've all had them. I feel like in some ways that's the best training you have for leadership. So I used to work at the US Department of State and I worked on the Iraq desk and my boss there, and I don't know if this is being recorded, but I'll just say my boss used to yell down the hallway, Krista, my seven-year-old has better grammar than you. And I would go, oh God, um, and I would get chewed out. But the thing is, is my grammar did get better. I think I learned a lot about writing memos. Well, that was just Canadian, right? Maybe, I was putting too many U's in things. Um, 
<laughs> but I feel like, you know, you have a bad boss, and I actually had a very good boss there, too. And I, it, it gave me a firsthand view of how a good boss and a bad boss are. And I learned what not to do. And I also learned, you know, my good boss actually protected me from my bad boss and let me get on with my job. And so one of the things at DREV I'm very particular about is culture and protecting people who need to be protected from kind of all the extraneous stuff so that they can get their damn job done. Um, the other thing I'll add on a Vanderbilt-centric note is I was actually the co-lead of Alternative Spring Break um, my senior year. I see a few heads nodding, which means I hope that there's a few ASBers out there. But um, that was actually great, too, because um, the year I took over ASB, we expanded it pretty drastically. We added, um, if any of you did a profession-specific site, that was the year I took over that we started it. So it was a great opportunity to kind of be like, woo, we're in charge. We get to do new things. And I think that's one of the great things about being a CEO is that you you, you're setting the vision and some of the new ideas that you're doing, and I first got to do that in ASB. Nice. That's good stuff. So, Neil, tell us about your experience and what most prepared you to lead. You know, at answering the question, what was the, the thing that most prepared me to lead, I think is a tough one. It feels like a, uh, a buildup over a long time, just the willingness and desire to take leadership positions even when I was a kid and you know, I think support from my parents and from schools and all that to, to get that. I, honestly, I think, so I'm, I'm older than most of you, so it's, it, to me, the most interesting thing about leadership at this point in my career is the willingness to continue to learn. I, I've, what I've, where I've screwed up, it's almost always been because I thought I already understood something. And the willingness to, uh, uh, to, to you know, you got to have confidence about what you're doing. And gosh, the difference between confidence and hubris, <laughs> sometimes it's just in hindsight. And um, I, I feel like one of the things, just to like a specific example, I thought I really understood how to uh, set goals and drive teams pretty aggressively. And... Uh, you know, I, I learned from other people, uh, 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 others who have who've done an even better job at that. And I, I adopted, um, you may or may not be familiar with this process called Objectives and Key Results, OKRs. It's kind of become more and more popular. Um, and really embracing that as a technique and as, a, as an approach uh, has really, you know, it was only when I admitted I don't fully, I don't have the best system. I see other better ways to do this uh, that we as a company really kind of decided we're going to make this our own. Um, and there's lots of other stories like that. So the willingness to continue to learn, I think, is important characteristic of leadership. So we're going to go to the 180 of that question now. Krista, you get to be first. Um, what leadership trait do you most struggle with still? Uh, <laughs> that's a great question. I think I still struggle with a lot of um, the human, the HR type issues. I think many of us, when we go into leadership positions, we don't think, oh, I really love like hiring and firing and dealing with employee issues. And I would say we actually don't have very many at DREV, partly because we're so small. But one of the things I struggle with is finding the balance, especially as we've been growing quite a bit the last couple of years, is finding the balance of when you're a small organization, everybody has a lot of say in things. And as you get a bit bigger, not everyone can have a say in things. And so finding the right balance of being able to give input, but also being really clear that there's a single decision maker and making sure that people um, transition through that okay. So I would say that's been one of the lessons learned for me um, in the last two years is kind of growing the organization and be going from kind of startup culture to more of a professional growth and, and structure. Thank you. Sunil, how about for you? The Of all the years experience you have, what are the things that you still say, damn, I wish I had remembered that already and not done that again? I, I mean... I still wish I could turn off my web browser and focus more often. Uh, uh, you know, there's a bunch of, I think you really want to talk about 
leadership and not these um, more narrow things. I think from a feels like the <laughs> probably the one thing if I could uh, uh, do a um, a better job is is being willing to uh, to 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 basically how do I say it uh, to be a little bit more of an asshole. <laughs> It's really easy to um, uh, to not do that, but it is, uh, and you know, you want to be uh, liked in that whole process. But there are times when it's just time for stuff that's not that nice to do. Um, firing people is probably top of the list, mm -hmm. and. You always wish that you had done it sooner. And that's kind of what I mean by, it's like in the Dilbert version of management, it's the, it's the jerky boss, but like the rest of the team relies on the willingness of the leader to do stuff that is not that pleasant. And if there's one thing I could change, it would be that. So Sunil, just a little quick follow up on that. When you finally do get rid of the person, how does it feel when everybody says it's about time? We were all waiting, wondering if you really saw what we saw and yeah. what took you so damn long. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's embarrassing. It's like, like I said, it's it's my job to recognize that this needs to be done, and when it doesn't happen, it reflects badly on me. So yeah, I, I, when I realize afterwards, but you know, the truth is, with maybe a few exceptions, <laughs> it's always been. In, in hindsight, you always wish you had done it sooner. So, Will, same question to you. What leadership traits are still a bit of a challenge or the things that you say, gosh, i got to get better at this? <clears throat> um, well, there was something that I was currently aware of. I mean, I think this goes with, with everybody. You're like, well, I'll fix it. But I think, you know, looking back historically of what's been the resulting pain point is in keeping with what they're saying. It's really down to hiring. Everybody likes to think that they can walk into a room, and everyone probably here thinks they're a good interviewer, um, because you just have this innate ability to determine whether or not someone's good or bad, right? Well, you're I wrong. <laughs> you're all wrong. You have no idea. As you know, typically someone who's articulate, you know, don't confuse articulation with proficiency ever. Um, <clears throat> you know, lots of politicians fall into this category. Well, all of them. Um, and this goes with employees, and people can really fool you based on, you know, your conversation and, and how they make you feel. You know, everyone wants to feel good. Someone makes you feel good in the interview room, you, you automatically have a very positive disposition with that person. Um, but um, I've cut short the conversations that I have with people and rely solely on back channel reference checking. I ask people for references, but I never call a single one of them. I use LinkedIn make sure my recruiters do the same thing, try to find um, some degree of connection that, uh, that can give me the real story on this person. We typically do a minimum of three to four back channel references for every single hire that we would do now. I made a lot of bad hires. It is really important to correct those decisions very fast, but you have to be extremely disciplined and calculating when you hire people. Um, this is especially, I mean, we, you know, we scaled from 90 people to 500 people inside of two years, and we made a lot of bad hires, and it took a long time to unwind that. I also made a lot of bad hires on the initial early team. I mean, typically you think that uh, a lot of people that you have in the beginning are the ones that really lay the foundation, but some of the early executives I hired, I mean, it took a solid one to two years to unwind some of the crap that they built into the system. Um, I'm really happy with where the company is right now, and we're, we're really efficient, especially at our size. I think that's pretty impressive. But I just I can't overemphasize enough that you have to be very careful with every single hire that you make, as long as you have the bandwidth to do it. I mean, we're over 500 people now. I interview every single person that comes into the company, and I make sure that I have a, a system of checks in place to see the feedback and the transcripts of every single back channel um, uh, conversation, uh, reference check. 
um, you've got to be disciplined about that because you're the one ultimately as, as the boss, as the leader who cares. Nobody is ever going to care as much of, as you. And if that ever happens, if that flips, you shouldn't be the boss anymore. Um, <clears throat> but at the end of the day, what are companies? It's a, it's, a, it's a culmination, it's a combination of people that you bring into an organization. That's all it is. So, you know, wouldn't you want to make sure that you guard and carefully select your most precious resource? Absolutely. So, long story short, you're a horrible interviewer. Don't trust yourself. Do back channel references. Thank so, a, a, a follow up on that. Given how fast you grew in two years, um, how did your culture change in that 24 months with that many new people coming in? Because it, it had to be a radical shift in 24 months for that much yeah. new blood being in the company that didn't have the history. It wasn't radical because we were growing beneath the existing leadership and we grew leadership slower and we were filling out other teams. Um, but there definitely was a change and we saw a lot of people, which I like to call the Silicon Valley mercenary. Um, it's these engineers or people in biz dev or product management that don't really have a particular affinity for your mission, cause, or product. Um, they're looking to vest for a year or two and hop on to the next train. I mean, they're looking for cruise ships, uh, cruise, cruise ships and it's really frustrating. Um, it's why I've, I've stopped, I'm not aggressively span, expanding in San Francisco anymore. I'm looking for other places. And typically in San Francisco, I know if it's on the engineering side, I don't hire them unless they're a game engineer and they're really passionate about the game that they're working on. Um, so, you know, we did, you know, we started to get in the news. Um, we had a lot of press and people were like, okay, this is the net next hot gaming exit. So I got to get on this train. And that really created a culture of entitlement and um, a lot of bad, um, just a lot of bad attitudes, a lot of whiny people, to be frank. Um, we've gotten rid of as many of those people as possible and replaced them who are super passionate about, about the games and the culture. And I think, I feel like things are now a lot like they used to pre-80 people, but now at scale. We've separated people into small teams. We don't believe in a big matrix organization. And we're fortunate where we have a bunch of products that we can scale horizontally versus having to throw hundreds of people at one game. We typically have a max size of about 50 per people per game. Um, so we try to keep that scale. So we have, you know, a collection of lots of smaller companies versus one big company, one bi big matrix. Um, but um, yeah, be wary of you know these full stack engineers who don't really give a shit about what you're working on. They just can just jack of all trades. They can do anything because they're not going to have a particular passion for the cause. And you do need people to drink the Kool Aid um, as long as you drink the Kool Aid. So. Yeah, you know, looking for more Kool-Aid drinkers. So if you like to play games, talk to me after. So Will has described a worker phenomenon that we call the tour of duty worker. Uh, they're, they're like the mercenary or the soldier of fortune who takes the two or three years and they have absolutely no interest in sticking around. And so you, you can't plan on building anything around them because just as by the time they get proficient, they've moved on. Chris, have you experienced any tour of duty people drop in through your place, or have you seen that, Sunil, in, in your business as well? I, I have. I have a bit of a different view in that I, I think as long as these people are contributing meaningfully um, and they're serving in roles that are uh, kind of functional roles, you certainly don't want a tour of duty kind of person that's only going to be there for two years and in an important leadership position in the company. Um, but, uh, you know, there are a bunch of talented people, and it's one of the reasons why, especially as you're growing a company, having even some leadership positions, like having a, a CFO that knows how to manage companies from, um, you know, say 50 people to 500 people, um, and does not, and, you know, around here sometimes that's only a short amount of time. Um, can be incredibly helpful, even if they choose to not stick around after that that um, that phase of the company's growth. Um, and it has to be balanced. You can't have a company filled with people who only want to be there for for uh, a couple of years. Um, but I, I don't think I don't have a philosophy of I don't want them at all. Um, 
it, it really just depends on on the role and and uh, I, I think also part of what I react to too is my overall philosophy around talent is I want everyone who comes through Sidecar to have the experience of, wow, it changed my life. I don't care if you're only there for two years. Like, I want it to be an experience of, I developed these skills, I met these people, I, I you know, contributed to the company along the way, but like, it is a place of, of, of growth and uh, I think that goes for everybody, including me. Uh, sidecar has changed me, uh, as it should. And uh, I do think that's a way to attract great talent because more than anyone, more than anything, I think people want to grow in their careers for the most part, and especially the ambitious, talented folks really want to go grow. Uh, so giving them a place where they can, they can see that in two, five years, uh, they are going to upskill and... Uh, and, and get the experience that lets them go do something even more amazing in, uh, in, in some other company or, uh, or at Sidecar, uh, I think really helps foster that, that idea that this is an opportunity for growth. We, we, we actually don't have that problem at all. And I think it's because we're a, we're a mission-driven organization. And one of the things I like to say is um, we're as a standard company is you know trying to maximize financial return we're maximizing impact return the thing i will say that we've definitely had a challenge with is that drev pays market rates for our staff and we have very highly qualified staff that could go to any company in the bay area and that's expensive but i also really believe in hiring top talent and retaining and if you look at nonprofit salaries it is dismal um, and so if you live in the Bay Area and you work for a nonprofit, I don't know if anyone here works for a nonprofit, it's almost like it's, people are paid so poorly, you have no choice but to go on to a different job within two years. And I've made it a priority at a board level with our, with our funders, with how our financial model is structured, that we can afford to pay our people the salaries they deserve while still um, doing a social mission type work. That's awesome. Congratulations to you. Well, we're not totally where we need to be yet, but one day um, soon we will be. But um, the one thing I will say is that it's been an uphill battle actually proving to um, even, even some of our board members, even though they're totally behind us, the value of retaining people and keeping the institutional knowledge in-house. Uh, I'm going to give you all a chance for a few questions, and if you don't have any, I have plenty. Yes, sir, you have a hand up. It's, and project it so everybody can hear the question. Oh my gosh. <laughs> He's going to let you stew on that. That's not a short question. <laughs> but yeah, sorry. Quick question, long answer is great. Gosh, every one of those are a dissertation sort of answer. Kristen, you get to be I'll, first. I'll go fast, yeah. So um, the short answer with the VA hospitals, I don't think any of us who've been following the news for the last couple of years are surprised. I mean, the New York Times and other media outlets have been reporting delays and challenges. We at DREV have gotten requests from, from veterans for our prosthetic knee, even though it was pre-market. So there's definitely, um, there's many answers to your question, but I think the first one is that anyone who is following patients on the ground knew that there had been problems at the VA hospitals for a long time. And of course, it's specific to specific VA hospitals. I don't want to paint everyone in a bad picture. Um, the one thing I will say with um, our prosthetic knee, so our prosthetic knee is $80. A comparable knee is about $1,400 in the U.S., but what our 
military veterans who um, are fit with a prosthetic knee coming back, you're looking at a minimum of $20,000. So um, we've had these young vets who contact us and say, hey, I want to go to the beach or I want to go kayaking. I ain't wearing a $20,000 knee to do that. So it's almost like they want to swap our knee in um, for those types of activities not quite treating it like a disposable knee, but like more of an active knee that they can bang up. But all of these things just indicate to me that there are major problems in the system, but there's been these red flags all along. We'll take yours next. Go ahead. Gamergate. <laughs> you know, one of the important things as a leader is you have to eliminate distractions. Gamergate is a distraction. Um, I don't even know. Okay. Did, did I, it, I feel like I only it. learned about it yesterday. Hey, some people did, did, just it, did getting... other people read about it? Today. Yeah, in the New York it's, Times, you know, the, the main media. It, it, you know, I have a, a different view than probably others. I'm not, I try to be not as connected to um, all the drama that's going on within my industry. I care about a few things. I care about, you know, what we're making um, what our culture is, um, how happy our, our, our teammates are, um, what our performance is, and outside of the company. And it, it's a luxury you have as a direct-to-consumer business. You know, we don't have a big sales team. We don't have to be, um, we don't have to have, um, we don't have to be as engaged within the industry. We, we are trying to be as engaged as possible with our players. Um, but outside of the company, I try to be engaged in terms of knowing exactly what our competitors are working on, what are the new emerging technologies, what are the platforms, where should we be next, what we should be focusing on. You know, when I see kind of drama, you know, hit the Twitter sphere and um, going on and IGN and, and other publications, I pretty much ignore it. I go to very few conferences because of this. I mean, so I have really no opinion because I don't care. Okay, so Neil, you get to answer your short question. Yeah, um, good set of questions. Uh, you asked about contractors versus uh, employee status. Uh, in fact, with Sidecar, uh, both the driver and the rider are not contractors. They are users of our platform in the same way that when you are a seller on eBay or a seller in the Amazon marketplace, you are a user of the platform, not a contractor. Uh, you set your own price, you set your own hours, you set your own uh, kind of what it is that you're offering out to the world. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's the way that we've structured things. Um, I got to say, it's, it is, uh, and it is different than the way that, that Uber, for example, operates, um, where prices are set and, uh, you know, there's, there's sort of, you have less discretion over where you're going to go and what kind of rides you're going to give. Um, one of the amazing things about this whole category of the sharing economy is just the enabling of a lot of income um, that was not possible before. And I have tell you, I don't know, you, you got to try a sidecar because some of the interesting people you end up meeting, um, I mean, they are literally everything from literally everything from molecular biologists to former homeless people. <laughs> I mean, it is the entire gamut. And I'm not, like, it's, it's not as if they're all molecular biologists or all, all former for homeless. But um, it is furniture designers and uh, surgeons taking a break from writing their book and retired airline pilots and, and stay-at-home moms. And, like, it's a, a, a wide uh, uh, spectrum of, of people. And they, what they have in common is they can make a few extra bucks. Sometimes they can make a living. And often they're able to quit their terrible existing jobs to go chase a passion, like the guy who now is a furniture designer. He's able to quit his job and start up. They're able to live here in San Francisco often, uh, even though they, you know, their, their main job doesn't generate that much income. Um, so it's, and these are now thousands of people around the United States that that have been able to uh, to do this. It's one of the most gratifying things about uh, being co-founder and CEO of, of this company. Okay, in the very back.
course, I'll start, and I'll answer with a single word, and that is execution. Ideas are cheap. Execution is valuable. Execution is the word. What's your word? I'm going to actually give two. Maybe that's cheating. Um, so the first is impact. Sorry, too bad. It makes it easier, right? Um, the first is impact because I think, you know, with everything we do, at the end of the day, we're, we're trying to maximize the impact. But the other thing I'll say, like, when you first said it, the first thing that popped in my head was actually determined. Um, I'm, I'm sure my other CEOs here were faced with someone or many people who said, you're not going to be able to do it. If I had, like... I don't know, $10,000 for every person I ran into who, when I explained our model, they're like, you're not going to be able to pull it off. Like, we would be doing so well right now. So I think, and, and that's one of the things, like, I like remembering now is we're getting a bit bigger and we don't necessarily have different budgets to do things. Like, we accomplished a lot on hardly anything. And we did it. And I think many of us who are in these roles um, were extremely determined to get where we are. Um, Michael's absolutely right around execution, uh, but to kind of expand on that, I'd say tenacity. Uh, you know, you can't give up. I mean, obviously, in, in absence of data that's telling you you're an idiot and you're wrong, you need to do something else. Stop beating your head against the wall. You got to keep up the enthusiasm. You got to maintain the drive, and you got to be tenacious. Uh, actually, relates to a favorite question of mine. Um, I ask people. Uh, what is the verb that, uh, when you're doing that thing, gives you the greatest satisfaction, gives you a sense of flow, if you're familiar with uh, Chick Sent Me High's uh, uh, idea, um, gives you fulfillment. And um, thinking about that myself 20 years ago, um, I realized that my, my verb is create. I, that's what I love doing. That's what I, gives me satisfaction, gives me joy. And ever since I realized that and have, and so it's less about the company, it's really about me. <laughs> but um, once I kind of realize that that's something that I should spend my time doing, and the reason why it needs to be a verb is it's what you do, it's not what you try to be or anything like that, it allowed me and encouraged me, okay, well, what are the ways that I can create? And, you know, one of my expression in the world is, and creation in the world is, happens to be companies and products like Sidecar. Um, but it's also given me permission to create other things. So, so, you know, the things you might typically think of in the creative arts of paint and write, and um, so far it's been mostly limited to that. But um, yeah, create. Over here. Okay, for those of you that can't hear in the back, the question was, what made the, what was the difference it made having the business here in San Francisco or the Bay Area instead of somewhere else that drove your success? Who wants to start that? I, I mean, I think I can easily say for Sidecar, fundamental to the success. Um, for starters, the particular innovation that we had, um, which was using an app to find a stranger to get and get in their car. <laughs> um, I mean, talk about people saying there is no way that's going to work. Uh, and interestingly, everybody in my demographic said that's not going to work. Like, move on to something else. But what I found were millennials. My co-founder is millennial. They were all like, "Yeah, I'm sure I'd do that," and as long as it was affordable. And so. And, but I do think that it, there's a willingness to try things, especially, and there's just a huge per percentage of early adopters and sort of tech-enabled millennials uh, here. Um, that really helps things take off a little bit faster. And then I think importantly, access to capital, access to talent is all, uh, is all here. Okay, Will, how is it important to be here in this part of the country to do this? 
Um, I think there's a lot of areas where we could have started this company, San Francisco being one of many, different from Sidecar. I, mean, I totally agree with in terms of got a great place for your market and customers and engineers and access to capital, which is absolutely true for us. Um, I think it's still a great place to start a company. There's other places as well, um, not just in the U.S. Um, I don't think it's necessary to maintain headquarters in San Francisco once you get to a certain point. Actually, a lot of the same reasons around hiring um, that made San Francisco very attractive in the beginning turn to kind of come around and bite you in the ass because you've got a lot of people looking for that same talent. And there are a lot of tech centers that aren't as fortunate as San Francisco in terms of the job market. Um, around the globe where you should open up offices when you're expansion. You shouldn't just rely just on the Bay Area and San Francisco. So, you know, great access to capital, good place to find early employees, people who are slightly more risk tolerant um, than other places. Uh, but once you scale, it's pretty critical to, uh, to diversify in other markets. Krista. So my perspective is a little bit different because I worked in Nairobi for uh, Nairobi, Kenya for four years. So a little different than Nova Scotia. Um, and one of the questions I get asked a lot at DREV is why are you headquartered in San Francisco? Because if our target markets are mostly India is our launch market, why aren't you located in Chennai where one of our partners is? And the short answer is you cannot prototype and iterate as quickly anywhere in the world as you can here in San Francisco. We can get materials overnight. We can go access 3D printing in, in shop, a bigger one just down the street. Um, one of our, our supporters is the Autodesk Foundation. And if, you've been, if you haven't been to the gallery just down here, it's amazing. But they give us access actually to their entire prototyping facility, which is like an engineer's dream. Um, there is nowhere in the world where you can do that, um, plus the talent, plus the ethos of this rapid iteration, rapid testing, user-centric um, approach, which I would attribute to the D school and even the precursor to the D school at Stanford. So this is a really fantastic place for um, at least anyone in my field. Awesome. Last question, Danny, will be you, and then uh, we'll we'll stick around in case some of the rest of you have questions. But last one. Okay, Krista, let's start with you since we started on the other end, and we'll end with Sunil. Is that all right? Sure. Greatest challenge you face, and how did you overcome it? Uh, um, let's see. <laughs> there, there's been there's been several. I think probably the one I would mention is um, I'm actually not a co-founder of DREV. I was brought in when the company was really struggling, and one of the things that was interesting is the board did not disclose to me how bad a shape the organization was in when I took it over. So um, that was probably my biggest challenge was, you know, coming in, you have a staff that was demoralized, um, the books were kind of a mess, everything was kind of a mess, but it had a bit of an illustrious early history for a very small organization. So one of the things that I actually found was the biggest challenge wasn't actually cleaning up the organization and turning it around, but was actually rebuilding the reputation of the organization, which for nonprofits is actually a very big deal because your reputation is pretty much everything. And I would say it took four years, um, from what I understand, that it, finally we were able to rebuild the organization, which has been amazing because um, we've been pretty revolutionary in the sense that we have, we're one of the first organizations ever to deliver market-driven medical devices to the highest need populations in the world. And you'd think that that would be something that would, would totally, you know, convert people, especially when we've done this in four years. But the whole reputation aspect of our early days has been one of our biggest, was, was one of our biggest challenges. Okay, Will, for you. Um, I'd have to say just working with other human beings in general. <laughs> I'm serious. I know, hard to believe, hard to believe. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I started my career as an engineer. Well, started, I mean, I started coding when I was like five years old. And um, so I've, you know, computer was my best friend. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when I got into a management role, um, you know, you can't approach it like a software engineer. You can't just tell everybody exactly what to do versus the computer doesn't really talk back unless you get a syntax error or something. <laughs> um, so, um, 
you know, in the early days of KickSci, it was relatively easy where, you know, I was the clear decision maker and it's like, do this, do this, do this. And then we found success and those people are like, okay, what are my next instructions? This is great. But as you scale, that doesn't work so well. You can't just bark orders at people. You have to, uh, now I w don't want to say that you have to build consensus. I think that's a, an evil word. You have to um, um, learn a lot of tact and learn how to work with people and, and make sure that people are not just, you know, the company's not just successful, but people are successful within their own roles. They're happy with what they're doing with other, you know, with, with what they're contributing. Um, people have to feel like they're empowered. At the same time, if, you know, you give everyone maximum empowerment, the company's probably going to fail. So you have to, otherwise, they'd be doing it themselves. So you have to really figure out that fine balance um, between, um, you know, giving instructions and empowerment. And that's, that's, a, that's a fine balance that really is unique to almost every single individual that you hire. So that's something that I'm always learning. Okay, Sunil, to you. Um, I think probably the biggest challenge was trying to become an entrepreneur, trying several times. I, I was first a, I was a NASA contractor, and I thought, oh, maybe I'll become an entrepreneur. This is back in the 80s, so <laughs> there wasn't all this commercial space activity that was a little easier to, to, to uh, be entrepreneurial in. I thought maybe I can do this, and I thought about it. I could not get that to work. I couldn't figure it out. I didn't have the cap. It just didn't work. Then I was, I was a policy analyst for a while, and tried to pull friends together that I knew to go chase an idea that I thought was great. And after about two or three meetings, one of them asked, "Well, who exactly is going to build this thing?" <laughs> And I realized I had no idea. I had no idea how it was, who was going to do it, how it was going to get done. And so I stopped that too. And um, I, I, almost, I almost decided not to become an entrepreneur and decided uh, maybe I'd go be an academic, go back to school and try to um, you know, take a different path. And, um, but I, I managed to convince uh, you know, an IT company, America Online, to, to hire me because of this little side project I'd done. So that, that pivot of, like, frustrated efforts at not quite trying, trying to become an entrepreneur, not quite doing it, um, and finally kind of overcoming that hurdle by really just trying all kinds of different angles and uh, working networks and leveraging side projects that I'd done in the past to demonstrate that I actually knew something about this, this new world. Okay, so I'm going to turn this back over to Tom. It's been a delight to visit with you from Nashville. Give our panel a big hand.